Okay, we're now going in. This is something I've asked. I've asked specifically for Lloyd to do at this time. Thanks, Lloyd, for for taking the time to do this. Uh, there's been a comeback. People have been saying, yeah, there are different gradations of what is important, what is uh, what is weak. Uh, you have what we, we know in the Hadith, you have the Sahih, you have the Hassan, you have the Taif. These are three different gradations. And in the same way that we only go to Sahih Muslim, Sahih Buhari, we go to Sahih, the six categories, the six uh, uh, Sahih Hadith compilations that are considered to be authoritative for the Sunni Muslims. Those are the only ones that you should read. Don't go to the Hassan, don't go to the Taif. In the same way, you are, have intimated that the that this also exists in Sharia law, but but you're going to do a caveat here, and you're going to actually throw a, a spanner in this because you're coming up with something that I hadn't heard before, and that is that maybe even the taif is also important. So go ahead, over to you. What is it you want to show us? I'd like to hear what you're going to say. I, this will be new for me as well. All right, thank you, Jay. Muslims commonly tell us that. These hadiths we're referring to are da'if. Even when we use the Sahih Muslim or the Sahih Bukhari, they will commonly use that. And of course, they will then turn around and use the very same collections as authoritative to prove their points. So I've just, I've just started calling them da'if Muslim and da'if Bukhari because whenever I quote them, Muslims tell me they're da'if. So I just call them da'if Bukhari, da'if Muslim. So that's what it is. But let me show you this. So, uh, well, what Westerners do not know is that Muslim scholars, these, these mujtahids, do not read the hadith directly. The, the, think of the hadith as raw material. So they've extracted everything they need from the raw material, and they've now processed that material, and they've created something with it. It's like you can take flour, you take sugar, you go and bake a fancy wedding cake. That cake is not just the flour. It's not just a lump of sugar. It's a very highly processed item derived from raw material. Now, scholars do not read the hadiths. When you look at what the scholars say, the scholars read what is called the tafsir of hadith. We're all familiar with the tafsir of the Quran by these major scholars like Ibn Kathir, who's written tafsir, commentaries on the hadith, sorry, on the Quranic verses. By the same token, what most non-Muslims don't know is that they are tafsirs of the hadiths. And the most famous of those is called the, the Fat al-Bari by Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. And this is what scholars read to extract information from that. Now, of course, this final information has been further extracted into the Sharia. So you've gone from the raw material source, the Hadiths, into the commentaries and into the Sharia as final rulings. The, the most sound of those rulings has now been considered collected and those most sound rulings are in the Sharia. But let me share my screen and show you the gradations of the Hadith and how this is considered. This is a collaborative work between Medina University, which is the city of the Prophet, and Al-Ashar University considered the most important, the most prestigious of all of the Islamic Sunni universities in the world. So these are the top two Islamic seminaries on earth that are collaborating to do a translation of the Tafsir Sahih Bukhari, as you can see here, the Fat Al-Bari. I'm sharing. So yeah, you can see my screen, Jay? I can, yes. Okay, so you can see this here. I will drop the link. We'll, we'll well, make this available. Just look for Fat or Bari in my archive and you'll find this. I'm going to jump ahead to page 12 and you guys are welcome to read this, to read the rest of the detail on your own. <clears throat> so this is page 11. Sorry. So these are some notes from the translators. As I said, Medina University, which is where the Prophet died. So they call themselves the city of the Prophet. And you can see the, from the students at, the, at Medina and, of course, the students of Al-Ashar. Notice what they say here. Removing weak hadith from works was not the example of the scholars. Now, Muslims love to tell us, oh, that's a weak hadith. But notice their scholars who they also, have you consulted a scholar? Well, I am consulting the scholars right now. And they said that removing weak hadith from works was not the example of the scholars. Otherwise, Imam Ibn Hajar would not have included them himself in the Fat al-Bari as sources to take knowledge from. It further says, weak hadith are used to support opinions because a weak hadith containing the words of the Prophet is preferred over pure opinion and personal reasoning, the personal ijtihad. This is the example set by all the scholars, including Imam Bukhari, 
who used them deliberately in his work, Al-Adab al-Mufrad. So Imam Bukhari also wrote works with not just the Sahih Hadith, but the less authoritative Hadith. And that work, one of those works is Adab al-Mufrad. Your thoughts so far, Jay? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is not what we've heard before. Uh, most every Muslim always falls back on the suggestion that anything you're going to bring up, Mr. Smith or Mr. De Jong, is daif. We don't need it. Nobody would use it. Now you're saying that Imam Bukhari himself used it. Uh, so did yes. Imam Ibn Hajar use it. So these, this is interesting because I never thought of this distinction. It is, whether or not you like it or not, it's still from the words of Muhammad. Therefore, it is above personal opinion. Correct. And it says here, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a collection of the Sahih Hadith specifically. I'll repeat that. The Sahih of Imam Bukhari is a collection of the Sahih Ahadith specifically. It is not a collection of the only Hadith that scholars should use. Now, I, I do need to make the caveat that the Muslims in the YouTube comment section are not scholars, just in case they had that idea. Now, the scholars themselves state a Sahih Hadith has about a 99 to 100% chance of being entirely accurate. A Hassan Hadith has about an 85 to 99% chance of being entirely accurate. And a Da'if Hadith has about a 45 to 85% chance of being entirely accurate. And this is the widest band of accuracy. And even a fabricated Hadith has a 0 to 45% chance of being accurate. Since the grading that that fabricated hadith was given may have been wrong, or the fabricator may have spoken the truth in this instance. So weak hadith should not be treated like fabricated hadith, because an 85% chance of being entirely accurate is a very high chance. So it goes on to say, if a person received 85% on his test scores, would he throw that out saying that isn't worth anything? So a Da'if Hadith is considered by the major scholars of Islam at the major universities of Islam to be 85% accurate and valid authoritative information. Each Hadith is treated individually. There is no such thing in Islam as banning an entire grade of Hadiths from being used. Even fabricated Hadith are still studied because one scholar may grade it fabricated, another may grade it Sahih, and there are many famous examples among the scholars of this occurring. Over to you, Jay. <laughs> well, well, I mean, Lloyd, this is fascinating. So really, there is nothing that really we really know is sahi. It could be, yes, they it is sub it is stipulated as sahi. Others are stipulated as Hassan, others are stipulated as Daif. But if you have a 45% to 85% chance of accuracy for the Daif, that is as good as Hassan. And almost as good as Sahih anyways. And it doesn't really matter because we don't know who decided what was Taif. There is not even a there is not even a consensus as to what is Sahih because you have one scholar may make this Taif and the next scholar over here may make it a, a, a uh, Sahih context. If you're going to have that disagreement, then therefore Taif is just as authoritative as Sahih. Now, here's the here's the fascinating thing. Are you even aware? I don't know if you are aware how they came to 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 stipulate Sahih, Hassan, and Taif. Are you? Do you know the manner by which they came to? Do you know what was the uh, through, categories for that? Supposedly through the Isnad chains. Isnad, and just explain to people what Isnad is. Not everybody may know what you're talking about. So these are chains of authority from the people who reported them. Supposedly, the more people. The, the wider the spread, for instance, if 25 people have reported something and they've reported it to 25 others, and let's say they reported it to 10, then you've got a very, very wide band of, oh, a very narrow band of accuracy, sorry. You've got a very strong degree of accuracy. But of course, if you have a single reporter to a single reporter to a single reporter, this is not considered necessarily as accurate, although that isn't necessarily the case, but in theory, so yes. But also the further it goes back to Muhammad, then of course the more authoritative it is because it goes back it's traceable but these chains can be fabricated and in fact western scholars have long for more than a century been stating that these chains are completely fabricated and arbitrary shocked um a german scholar in the 1950s actually did a whole study on what are known as is not as and mutton mutton are actually the 
the phrase Content. that is being sent down from word of mouth. See, this is just oral tradition. Word of mouth to word of mouth. So and so said it. Who gave it to so and so? Who gave it to so and so? Who gave it to so and so? Who got it from the prophet himself? Now, um, I'm sorry, so that we run. Yeah, who gave it, who was finally written, it was finally written down to by Buhari. But the first so-and-so supposedly heard it from the Prophet Muhammad himself. This is what's interesting. And Shak brought this out. He said, prior to 820, look at the date, not, that's ninth century, prior to 820, there were no, rarely was there an Isnat that went back to Prophet Muhammad. It just came from one of the companions of the Prophet. Shafi then stipulated that every Isnat must trace its lineage all the way back to Muhammad himself from his lips. Otherwise, it could not be Sahih. Suddenly, mm -hmm. a whole new set of Isnat was created for every one of these Matan. And every one of them then suddenly went back to Muhammad's own lips, which said, suggests, and this is what Shaq said. This means it was only created in the ninth century, proving that probably none of these Isnats are authoritative because nobody wrote it down. So you have no idea whether so-and-so really said what he said to the other purpose. But do you notice, are, are you seeing the similarities, Lloyd, between how they chose which are the, the Sahih Isnat with, with the Kirats and the Ahruf? Remember the Kirats and the Ahruf? Remember these guys here? Remember how uh, Ibn Mujahid chose seven. Where did he choose those seven from? And where did Al Jaziri, who comes in, oh, the they, cho they choose that based on popularity? Popularity. It had nothing to do. In fact, with it's based on what they call in Islamic law. They call that persuasion. Those who are the most persuasive, because of the number. It's whoever is has the most number of students, which interestingly usually came with those who have with, were living in the largest cities. You would have more students if you're living mm. in a larger city than if you're in an obscure town where you yeah. only have one or two students, but you may be much closer to the event or even have heard it from the eyewitnesses. But that doesn't count. It all has to do with how many students you have. Well, this is the same thing you're, that we have with Isnad. Isnad works the same way. It has nothing to do with authority. It has nothing to do with legitimacy. It has nothing and very little to do with eyewitness because the eyewitness didn't even begin to be created until yeah. the ninth century, which is already 200 years after yeah. And that's so Shafi. fascinating. And in fact, they, they steal that idea from, from the Jews. In fact, I uh, will go through that as we, well, once we go directly in the next show into the actual presentation, as I, as I go through the slides, I'll actually show you the development of all of this, how Shafi took all of this stuff and he will go through it step by step historically. And you'll see because Sharia is so well documented. There's so many hundreds and thousands of these documents. So you can trace it, Islam's development politically and legally historically from the 8th to the 14th century because there's just so much documentation <laughs> i mean fascinating and so can you see how certain people when they put the the in the manual what is to be sahih hasan or taif strong weak or middle or weak they had they realized that many of the taif are actually very good jurisdictions and they do need to be used and they make sense and they probably are much more authoritative than many of those that are sucky. That's why you, they had to write what you've just written there, what you've just read. It stands to reason now that that means almost everything that most that we're going to read can be considered to be authoritative, which puts the Muslims in a real bind here uh, because they are now going to have to also defend that which is taif and not just shove it off and say it doesn't make any sense. If it goes from 45% to 85% by, ju by jurisdiction of popularity, then why is that any less or more than the Sahih, which is uh, from 99 to 100%? The only reason they came to 99 to 100% had nothing to do with whether it was true, had nothing to do with whether Muhammad ever said it, had everything to do with how many students you have. <laughs> Isn't this lovely? Yep. Okay. And how they could use that for their own political purposes. For their own political purpose. There you go. Thanks so much, Lloyd. Uh, the more we unpack. Yeah, this is, you know, we have this phrase that we always used all the time in London. Uh, the, the more we scratch, the more we find. The more we find, the more we shine. The more we shine, the more they whine. Oh, how sublime. It looks like the more that you're scratching, the more you're finding, and they're not at all happy. Uh, I can understand why they're not happy, because we're, put, we're using their own science against them. We're looking at their own criteria, and we're just taking what they say from their own mouths, even their own percentages, as you've done here, and then how they even say, regardless of whether those percentages may look bad, it could be from someone who is authoritative, therefore will accept it. God bless them for telling the truth, which makes it all the more difficult now for them to walk away from these injunctions, these very embarrassing injunctions. Thank you so much. God bless you. This is Jay. God bless you, Lloyd. Over and out.